don't think that the PR is a sort of magic solution, that they're just going to wave their wand and suddenly everything's going to come falling towards you. Business of Architecture UK, episode 46. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I am your host, Ryan Willard, and this week I'm in Blackfriars, which is always an interesting part of London. It's where lots of the legal profession have their offices and there's all sorts of wonderful old courtyard arranged buildings and office blocks with tiny little wooden panelled offices with people whirling away in there and doing all sorts of interesting writings. And it's also where my guest this week, Robert Fien, has his uh, offices. And Rob is a PR. Um, He runs his own uh, business called Robert Fien Architectural Communications. He's worked with some of the best architects in the country, helping them develop their communications both internally and externally. He used to work for the bespoke design PR agency Caro Communications as a, an account director. Um, he's also worked as a media and client coordinator at Roger Sturk Harbour and Partners. And previously to that, he was an editor at Fiden, where he was involved in a number of large scale projects. So he's got a very impressive career um, and this week I, uh, me and Rob were chatting and he was telling me about when people should not get PR and he was saying how he often gets practices and people approaching him to do PR and they're not always in the best position to be doing it or there's lots of other pieces of the puzzle of the marketing puzzle that have got to be in place first before he can actually give them what it is they need and actually be the most effective so Rob thought it was really important to address this um, as a podcast and he goes into a lot of detail about when PR is a bad idea so this is a really fascinating conversation so sit back and relax and enjoy Robert Fien. Hello and and welcome to the Business of Architecture UK. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And today I'm with PR maestro, Robert Fien. Always a pleasure to have you on the show, Rob. Thanks, Ryan. And I know that you've got some a brilliant kind of little discourse prepared for us, what we can talk about today. And today we're going to be talking about when is PR actually a bad idea? And when should practices really kind of hold their horses and not engage with someone like yourself or there's a whole set of things that need to be ready before the investment of PR. Yeah, yeah. I'm kind of doing myself out of a job, which I do on a regular basis. (laughs) But it is important, I think, uh, to prevent people from being really unhappy with PR. So being confused. So so as as an example, if if I'm an architect and I come to you and I've seen, perhaps I've, you know, I've got a, a, a medium-sized practice. There's maybe 10 people. Yeah. That's well, still still small. But um, that sort of scale of practice, we're starting to get a little bit of traction. We're starting to win bigger projects. And I'm seeing lots of my contemporaries and peers yeah. in AJ and in the Architectural Review or in Design and all these types of things. And I know I've got a sense that I need to be out there I need to be so I've come to you what's the process well how do we start so I'm deeply suspicious of everyone (laughs) who asks me for beer and essentially it's I guess it's when they've not done it before and a lot of people come to me and say I've never done PR before Uh, what's the deal and uh, when do we get started it's a very sort of matter of fact transactional relationship. Yeah. And so immediately I start questioning them, uh, why do you want PR and why now? So as you say, if they say, well, my mates are doing it, uh, I say, you know, that's not a good reason. Yeah. Uh, if they say they just generally want to build the profile of the practice, but they have no specific reason. Mm. Uh, again, I'm I'm on edge. Yeah, um, it's not a terrible thing, but I'm worried a little bit. Yeah, um, and then if they turn around and say, "Work's been a bit, we've been drying up. We're seeing some gaps in you know in our portfolio coming up, and we thought PR might help with that." That is true, but it is not. 
it's not a one you know one size fits all solution mm. to business problems. Definitely not. So what is so what is PR not? Cause that's quite that's quite interesting. Cause I mean I've I've often thought myself, I know I need to get in, I need to get published. That will solve that will solve something. Yeah, it will it will help it will help. I know at least I'm out there, or if the very least, at least I'll feel good about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, that's another thing. Often it's just to make people feel a bit better about the work that it's been sort of peer reviewed uh, in the press, and that uh, uh, they kind of feel vindicated for their approach mm. and their and and you know it's nice for the practice to feel that their work is recognized you know every level from, from director to junior but if you start paying money for a consultant to help you get pr and you're doing it for vanity that it's not necessarily going to support your business and i think that's what we're interested in you and i mm. uh, is that PR should be a tool to support wider strategies, win more work, um, meet more interesting people, you know, generally be known as an expert for what you do. Yeah. Um, so the first thing I always ask an architect is, do you have a business plan? Right. You know, or what is your, you know, even if it's not a formal business plan, which some people freak out about, you know, is there, is there, are there aims and goals for the practice? You know, are there sectors you want to work in? Are there specific clients you'd like to reach? You know, and sometimes they say, no, nah, never really thought about it. We just win work. It's a range of typologies and uh, we've, we've never had a structure to it. So I, I tend to then start backing off and saying, well, I would recommend getting your business aims sorted first. If you've got other directors, maybe you need to have an away day, sit down with them, uh, or meet a new business development manager, and they can help you structure that. Uh, and then maybe once you've got that sorted, you can think, well, all right, well, what PR can we do to support uh, those goals? And then I'm, then I'm, then I'm more useful to you. Or someone like me. So, 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 what sort of business plan makes your eyes light up, and you're like, "Oh, this is, you know, this is this is exciting." I think the more targeted, the better. Yeah. So, if they can say to me, "Right, we," um, so I worked with a smallish practice recently, who had done a lot of private residential work. They wanted to move into housing. I think that's quite normal. They were very keen on it being public housing. And so we structured all of the PR and communications and marketing towards that. So in terms of speaking at or attending uh, events about housing, writing about housing, entering design idea competitions, you know, the works, it was totally focused on public housing. And that gives me a great structure to work with. I can do a plan. We can sit down. We can agree. Everyone can feel that there's a mission. Yeah to the PR and if you're working with a PR agency or a consultant and you just send stuff off to them and they go quiet and they're supposedly doing something behind closed doors, I would be very worried. Right. I would say maybe now's not the right time. Right. So what then what? You've got, you've got a kind of clear mission, you've got uh, something in your business plan, then what would be the next, the next steps? I'd say don't hire me. Right. Because... Uh, I think uh, it's important to remind everyone that PR is a subsection of marketing. Right. So marketing is the umbrella, the umbrella thing which addresses your uh, your practice. You know your website, marketing materials, so brochures, direct mails, newsletters, social media. That is all marketing. PR, which is often to do with the press and events, that is part of that strategy. So. If someone turns around to me and says, oh, God, I hate our website, I'd say, well, if you get some PR and people look you up and they also hate your website, right? what was the point in the PR? You know. So there's, there's a big danger here that if you go forward with PR and you haven't got these kind of foundational marketing assets and collateral right, that you're only going to compound, you know, errors or miss messaging. Yeah. Yeah, you could, you know, and like the way that a client might badly brief an architect, 
it's exactly the same thing. You badly brief a PR person, they go off and do their job, then you might be upset that the end result is not what you wanted. And it's, it's really your fault. So you, you need to be super clear. And, and so uh, marketing people, uh, slightly different to PR people, are very good at you know, sorting out your key messaging, mm. you know, kind of drilling down to exactly who you are and what you stand for. And then PR can then take all of that information and embed it in all their materials. So again, I might uh, reject a client in the sense that I'll say, I'd love to work with you, but maybe talk to a marketing consultant uh, or even employ a marketing person in your practice, depending on the size, um, to help sort this out first. Then let's talk about PR. Right. Okay. So, so it's often, you know, you can kind of have a business coming towards you that's a little bit headless in some aspects mm. in terms of that, you know, what, and what, what are the key elements of the marketing that need to be on point or that, or that help if they're really, really, you know, good and they're satisfied of it, that can make your job that much more powerful. So ultimately, so ultimately, even if I'm selling a project, I'm really selling the practice through PR. Right. So what you want is you want to have everything lined up marketing-wise that tells your story through a written and visual narrative. So a project comes out, someone goes, wow, that's amazing, looks at the practice and then sees a portfolio of work that is cohesive, you know, that sort of lines up and they go, oh, yeah, so they did that one nice project, but they also done this and this and this. And it tells the potential client, that this is an architect where they're going to get a certain kind of project and that aligns with their aspirations and they pick up the phone mm. if they look you up and they just see a sort of disparate we do a bit of everything and uh you know in all you know in, in a sort of vague non-directional way they've sort of you know they, you might lose that person who you you don't know that they looked you up mm. but you've you've lost them at the first hurdle so i'd much rather see a practice who felt confident with their representation uh, first so is it not necessarily to do with the scale or maturity of a practice, but more to do with the maturity of their marketing and their messaging that makes PR more effective? Yeah. And I think it works from mega practices down to, you know, tiny studios. Uh, they, all, they all need to get their messaging clear and it can be difficult for a variety of reasons. And that's why you sometimes need outside help. Or you just need to spend time if you have, you know, several directors... Uh, or, or even, you know, a director and senior associates. Mm. If you could maybe sit down and actually have a chat about it, which people never do, um, you're going to have a much better end result. Don't think that the PR is a sort of magic solution, that they're just going to wave their wand and suddenly everything's going to come falling towards you uh, in the right way because, yeah, you might get inquiries from the wrong people. Right. And why do you think people often see PR as being the magic cure-all? And I know a lot of, as, as I said before, in myself, kind of there is a, a natural drive to be like, if I get out there, if I get in publications, then somehow this will solve something. Where I does, think, I think they're just not from? aware of the process. Right. There's nothing wrong with that. Why should you be? You're an architect. Mm. Your job is to design buildings and spaces. Mm. So why should you be aware of all these other things that are a part of your business. You have to learn that over time. And some architects have practiced for decades and not found that out yet. So it's not shameful or embarrassing. Uh, it's just, I think it's important to listen to this kind of advice mm. uh, and take that on board and know that those mates you've seen getting covered in the press, they've probably gone through this process. They've probably done it. If, if you think it's good coverage, They've probably gone through some soul searching and then done the PR. Right. Okay. So let's, let's imagine, going back to our sort of hypothetical situation, and I've come to you and I've got my sort of foundations in marketing right, and it's kind of a coherent message, then what, what would be the next step there in terms of allocating resources to PR? Right, exactly. So I might then turn you down again. Right. And the reason for that <laughs> being is I would say... If, if I'm talking to the director of a practice or a founder, do you have the time to do this? Because 
PR is not uh, a one-way street. You don't just give me stuff and then I go off and do it. I, it involves a bit of back and forth. So you get say we organize a press release, we send it to a magazine, they want to publish it. Immediately, the first thing they're going to do is have questions. They want, they're going to want written answers or spoken answers on the phone. They might want to visit something, which takes time. They're going to want photos that you're happy with. They're going to want clean drawings if they're an, if they're an architectural design publication. Right. So you can't then just say, well, hang on a second. I just wanted the PR. I've paid someone to help me get it. Yeah. I just want it. I or, don't... or we thought this was your job. Yeah, we thought it was your, exactly. <laughs> So you've got to sit down and think, do we have the resources to do it? Now, some directors do. They can just put time aside and say, well, I'm so organized, I'll do my normal day job and then I'll do my media stuff. And that's fine. And if, if they say that to someone like me, well, let's get cracking and hopefully it's true. Uh, you might have an office manager or, uh, uh, as I said, like a, an associate level person in the practice who you say, right, well, you're... I'm giving you the green light to focus on marketing and PR. I want you to talk to this guy and come back to me now and again. And um, we'll all do this as a team. That's also great. But you might, certainly in medium to large size practices, that's a big ask of an architect or an office manager. So I have often said to people, don't employ me, get an in-house marketing or comms coordinator. Right, to well, do this stuff for you. Right, and what's the what's the benefit of of that? Why would that work better than you? Because I'm outside. I'm working for multiple practices, or if you know, if I was an agency, I've got multiple clients. You know, I'm outside of the building, so uh, I don't know what's going on unless you tell me. And if you're too busy to tell me, we've we've already fallen over. So an internal person can organize your files can line up a timeline of activity, you know, look ahead to awards and events, have a chat with the director on a daily basis, say, this is what we're doing, um, and actually structure it. And then if they need some PR support, because that's a big job, they then need some PR support, you can get some outside help. But uh, really those people are invaluable. And architects who think, I can do that remotely, and when they're not organised, mm. it always goes badly wrong. Right. Okay. And then, so they've got a lot of marketing ready. They've got the time, the resources. You say yes. Then what happens? So then, if we're general profile building, let's go. If it's a project, I'm like, okay, <laughs> pause again. <laughs> Right. Pause again, because there are some serious questions we need to ask. So if they say, right, we've got this amazing project, it's going to be finished in two to three months. Uh, we can't wait to tell the world about it. And I say, what's your client like? And they say, oh, the client is very, very private, hates coverage. You know, and this can be in any sector. Not just private residential. Not just huh? private residential. It can happen in, you know, uh, uh, offices... Um, housing, uh, all sorts of sectors, the client, for whatever reason, isn't that keen on people knowing what buildings they own or operate um, or what, you know, what deals they've made, uh, what land they own. So for mm. all sorts of reasons, yeah. someone can be a private person and that's fine, that's their business. So if I say, right, is your client on board? No, they hate PR. Hmm, maybe we need to have a rethink because having your client on board is very important. If they're needed for interviews um, or if they needed to offer access to the building, for certain journalists, if they're going to say no, it's going to really hamper your chances. But don't despair <laughs> because you can park PR and think about other things you could do with a building. Maybe you can take people on visits they could be potential. So you think about business before PR. Mm. Maybe you could take people on uh, little trips and say, "Look at this building I designed. Would you like one of these or mm. something similar?" Is this is this something particularly with, with clients that might be of a particular you know private nature or they're you're dealing with very sensitive corporate material? Um, 
Is it something that you can bring up at the very early stages of negotiations when you're doing contracts with an architect? Like you can say, we really want to be able to promote this. Can we talk about that at some point? Or when should that kind of conversation happen? Yeah, I mean, I think it can certainly happen informally. Like you can gauge from your client and say like, oh, you know, we're really looking forward to this. Uh, you know, it'd be great to do an announcement when this amazing concept is finally ready. And if they say, oh, I never do that. Mm. You, you've already got a good sense that that's, that's not going to go well in PR terms. But people do also write things into contracts. They do say, as, an, as your architect, I you know, withhold the right to take photographs and use them to promote my practice. And if the client signs that, they're probably not going to read that clause. If they sign right. it, legally, you can do that. You know, I don't think PR and marketing is worth legal battles, but, um, you know, it's pretty rare stuff. But you, you, can, you can definitely put it in your, um, in your contracts. The only thing you can't do is demand that a client joins in on the press campaign. Right. Because okay. that's always up to the individual. Yeah. Got it. Okay, so we've got the completed building. We've yep. got the client is on board. No, well, let's stick with clients not, not on board. Not on board, okay. Not on board. What else you can do with the building? Yeah, okay. I think um, I think awards are great. Uh, not all awards. You've got to, you've got to pick and choose your battles. Um, but there are so many out there. That there are probably some good ones that are right for your, built, your, built, your type of building. Mm. So there's some ones that suit other certain sectors better. Um, and what's great is being even shortlisted for an award screams to poten other potential clients, this person is one of the best six in the country at this type of building. So that's really nice. Obviously, winning them is great. You can say that you're award-winning practice. And the great thing about awards is they're often attached via media partnerships to the press. Right, okay. So without any client interview or, or involvement, you can get an article saying, uh, this building is, you know, according to the Sunday Times, this building is one of the best uh, housing developments uh, in, the, in the country. Great. What well, great PR. You know, in a sense, that's, that's better than, uh, you know, a small article about an element of your building. Yeah. You've been, you've been held up against your peers as uh, a great example so I think awards are good the only problem is there are a lot of um, uh, con merchants out there and you can generally tell by the quality of the website you know or and the, if you're all the, these sort of initiating email saying yes saying I mean I've had them people approach me and say you've you know your practice has been nominated for practice of the year uh, come and collect the award. It's eight hundred quid for 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 a ticket to the award ceremony or something like that. And I'm like, a massive red really? flag. A massive red flag is if you've already been shortlisted to something you've not entered. Right. It's probably not a real award. <laughs> you normally need to enter and pay a fee. Uh, some of them are actually the fee itself is not a good uh, marker of how good the award is. There are some really good cheap awards out there. Uh, and there are some really terrible, really expensive awards. So it's not the the fee is not a good indicator, but yeah, certainly the website or what what publication it's linked to. If it's a, you know, if it's the AJ or a Building Magazine, and you really respect those magazines and they have awards, yeah, it's you can got... feel quite confident. Um, uh, also, the phrase in an email at no cost to you. Don't worry, there's no cost to you. If that's in an early line of any email from a journalist um, or an award, it means there's a cost. Because normal, so. normal <laughs> people don't say that. They don't say at no cost to you. That's 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 the language of the uh, con merchant for sure. Right. And is that, and so that's that. Uh, I find it amazing that there's there's that part element of the industry that exists. Yeah, but it's big money. Yeah. You know, and uh, there are, you know, there are media companies that are propped up by their awards and their events series, you know, because it's a, it's a tough market. It's tough to make money off uh, magazines these days. Yeah. 
but you know, but awards are can be great, and I know a lot of people are suspicious about them. But um, if you're careful about what you enter and don't just go for it, and mm. look, trying to look a year ahead, if you can, uh, if you type in Architecture Awards UK, there's a website that lists them all for you. It's not hard. Right. People say to me. How can I know what awards to go into? Most of them are listed on this one link that comes up. Architecture Awards UK. Yeah. And I think it says architecture and construction on the website. But, you know, if it's for contractor of the year, don't enter. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, so we've got, we've got awards. What else can you do with the building? Is there anything else? That... Well, going back to our discussion about marketing, you can produce yep. uh, material to hand out. Um, to sell your approach to architecture via your buildings. Um, you can pop them on social media and be very proud about them. Uh, you can, if, if, there, if there is a series of projects you've done that all relate to a specific theme mm. or sector, you can gather them together and maybe hold an event and talk about the issues facing the industry. So there's all sorts of things you can do, sometimes without even getting people to step inside the building. But... I would argue that there's many cases where PR is not, not needed Brilliant. in the traditional sense. Brilliant. I think that covers everything. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you so much for your time, Rob. That's been a real masterclass. No worries. I, I hope I still get some work. <laughs> <laughs> so that is a wrap. Thank you for listening. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.